In keeping with what we started a few weeks ago, although we deviated a little bit from it, I want us to continue to study about denominations. And our purpose in this particular study is to learn about the Lutheran Church. And I think the best way that we can understand it and its doctrines is to begin by looking at Luther's life and then the system of what's called Lutheranism. And then we'll try to look at certain of the doctrines themselves. And then we need to always be mindful of the fact that the church needs to be aware when it is leaving the truth and maybe heading in some of the directions these man-made churches go. And I'm not sure how much of this history I need to go into, knowing that some of you just fall at the feet of good history and would never go to sleep in it. I'll try to keep that in mind. <laughs> First, I'd like for us to look at the whole system of Lutheranism. It was, and this is one reason I've, I'm using it here and, and dealing with it, the first of those churches that rebelled against Roman Catholicism. Other efforts had been made before that, but this is the first one that really caused a stir in Europe and thus began to set forth what went all over Europe and impacted America early on as far as... Uh, <clears throat> protesting the corrupt practices of Roman Catholicism. Martin Luther was born in Germany in 1483 and is a well-educated person. He entered a monastery in 1507 and he was a member of what's called the Dominican Order. He was assigned to teach theology at the University of Wittenberg where he did teach the Book of Romans and the Book of Galatians. In that developmental period, he began to emphasize faith as he understood the New Testament to teach it. And he began then to oppose the meritorious work system that is peculiar to Roman Catholicism. There was a fellow about that time by the name of John Tetzel, you may have heard of him, who was authorized by the Pope to go throughout Europe and sell indulgences as a way of making money, which really a lot of that money went into the building of the uh, uh, St. Peter's Basilica. It's over there to this day. And um, this was, I guess you'd say, the straw that broke Luther's camel's back. <laughs> uh, on October 31st in 1517, Luther nailed what he called his 95 Theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, I think it's important that he never considered himself beginning a new church. What he wanted to do by posting those theses was to stimulate a discussion of these abuses that many people saw in Roman Catholicism. Seemingly, most of these people never thought about, well, if the church didn't have New Testament authority to exist in the first place, then if you correct the corruptions in it, you still have something not authorized by the New Testament to begin with. A few of those people thought that route. And if we were there in those days, we might understand better why they did because they hadn't known for 100 years anything but the Roman Catholic Church. Hundreds of years. So, reforming it was not what he had in mind from the standpoint of where it would lead and what that reformation would turn into. Uh, Pope Leo X dismissed Luther's actions as simply a, quote, debate among the monks, which those things went on all the time. But by 1518, things had got much stronger than that, and they charged Luther with heresy. Well, it was at that point, as you see these things growing, Luther renounced the Pope's final authority in religious matters. Well, that really throws things around. And uh, he stated that the Pope's councils were subject to error. Well, that is hitting it right at the heart of Roman Catholicism. Thus, he was excommunicated in June of 1520. 
Now, to show the further disdain that he had for Roman Catholic Church trappings, he reacted to the papal bull announcing his excommunication in December of that year at Wittenberg, and he publicly burned the thing. Well, that's what you really talk about, burning your bridges behind you, because that, that was just about it. Now, the name Lutheran was used by the Pope in Luther's excommunication and then began to be used commonly among Luther's friends. But Luther never wanted that. Luther said, and I quote, I pray you, leave my name alone. Call not yourselves Lutherans, but Christians. That's from the life of Luther by Stork, page 289. Well, it's interesting that all these years have passed, and today Lutherans wear the name given to them, of all things, by the Catholics. Originally, and they don't regard Luther's pleadings as significant, but they have such great respect for him. They, of course, still hold him up as the way to go. Fundamentally, and we may say more about this later, uh, Luther held the view that if it's not expressly prohibited in the Bible, you may do it. Luther believed then in salvation because of his reaction to meritorious works of the Roman Catholic Church, in salvation by belief or faith alone. But he did believe that one ought to be baptized, <clears throat> immersion as opposed to the pouring practice by the Catholics. He believed those things were necessary, but he never got all that straightened out as to why you're really baptized, what's the purpose of baptism. It's interesting that he was so uh, determined to reject any kind of works that the Bible might speak of that one must practice to become a Christian that he rejected the book of James and uh, he called it a book of straw because he actually thought that uh, Paul was contradicted by James where Paul wrote what he did about faith in Romans three twenty seven and so on and, and what James then wrote in James two twenty four. It shows you how any one of us can through many years of uh, viewing something through very narrow and dark colored glasses that we just can't see beyond them. Because any kind of works, and it still is that way today, are those who believe salvation by faith only. They cannot see any kind of works being done except to merit salvation. They fail to realize there's no other way to show God your faith except through taking Him at His word and acting upon it. If you were to say to somebody, well, I'm going to show you my faith, in God and Christ and the gospel system. But I'm not going to obey his commandments. Well, then how would you do it? And the truth of the matter, you couldn't. And Jesus even said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And James did teach that faith without works is dead, meaning that a living faith is an obedient faith. Hebrews 11 makes that very clear. Another strong belief of Luther was the um, universality of uh, all believers or the priesthood of believers. And that, of course, is the case. Every person who becomes a Christian, as the Bible talks about Christians and defines it, and a person becoming a Christian, then we are priests. Uh, every Christian is a priest, and we go through our high priest, the only mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, in order to get to the Father, and thus we do all things by His authority or through Him. And Jesus taught plainly in John 14, 6, that He's the only way to the Father. And the priesthood at that day and time the priesthood of believers, became the cornerstone, really, of all those different groups that protested the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church early on. And that, of course, wouldn't be tolerated by Roman Catholicism because they believe in the, in the clergy laity system and only the clergy are the priests. And only through them does God grant salvation through grace. Thus, uh, the priests stand between a person and salvation. And when you're excommunicated, then you can't be... Uh, dealt with as if you are acceptable to God so all matters of grace and you have to have grace to be saved are cut off from you and they even go so far as to say you can't be buried and buried in holy ground which is a cemetery that's been blessed by a priest because everything is extended to man regarding salvation through whatever the priest says as the Roman Catholic Church describes that and this of course is what they were rebelling against now, at the Diet of Worms in Germany in 1521, 
Luther was asked to renounce his writings against Rome, but he refused to do so unless shown to be wrong by the scriptures. Now, you've got to realize, again, as I've said many times, Roman Catholicism, does, they, they simply don't take the scriptures and the scriptures only as a sole rule of faith and practice. They believe in the teaching arm of the church and the scriptures. So where the teaching arm of the church rules differently from what's said in your Bible, then they accept what they say. And that would, the teaching arm of the church is the magisterium, which is, of course, composed of the Pope and his councils and cardinals and so forth when they are sitting officially to make rulings. So this kind of rejection by somebody like Luther at that time was really a slap in the face as far as they were concerned. And it was so bad that he had to go into seclusion. And what better thing to do when you're hiding out for your life and in seclusion but to translate the New Testament. <laughs> so that's what he did. He translated the New Testament into German. And he did it for the common people because one of the things that all those people had in mind was get the Bible into the hands of the common people because it had been against the law to own the Bible. And it's very interesting just to study all of this for the next, say, from 1500 up. Uh, in the various ones that protested or were part of the Protestant Reformation movement and just see how that they really did not like anybody just having a Bible reading it for themselves. And you can see that even at the church of England uh, came to existence. We won't go into all that history. Henry VIII divorcing his wife and becoming head of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, and thus the monarch of England is still the, the head of it. But uh, they wouldn't allow, they didn't want uh, uh, English version. And people were burned at the stake by both Catholics because they didn't want them to have it. And then they, even the Church of England did. Uh, it's amazing how the devil could get hold of things uh, by a corrupt church and control governments, well, they believe they ought to control the government too, and uh, then, therefore, control keeping the seat of the kingdom, the word of God, out of the hands of people. Oh, I think it's interesting to note, too, that he, he had an alias while he was hiding out. He was called Junker George. <laughs> uh, at the Diet of Spears in 1529, the Roman Catholic Church realized that such a big to-do going, they're willing to compromise somewhat. So what they said was is that uh, Catholics in predominantly Lutheran territory could have religious freedom to, of worship. But Lutherans in predominantly Roman Catholic territory could not. And the Lutherans uh, filed a protest. Protest. And thus the word Protestant came attached to that whole movement. And it designated then everybody that broke away from Rome as being Protestant. Now, I think if you ask most, as I said before, denominational people today, and you say, oh, you're a member of a Protestant denomination. And they say, well, yes. And then you say, what are you protesting? They don't even connect protest with the word Protestant. So what are we protesting? This kind of thing. Uh, I say that the Lord's church, faithful to the cause of Christ, is the only God-authorized Protestant on this earth because it protests all things contrary to the will of heaven as presented in the New Testament and opposes them. It calls people back to thus saith the Lord proposition for everything they believe in practice. Now the Augsburg Confession was presented at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530 by Philip Melanchthon and that would be another fellow you might like to study about. He was instrumental in this. He was in fact Lutheran's representative and he stated uh, the basic Protestant principles at that. And this actually turns out to be the creed or declaration of their particular faith uh, for that day and time. Now, you've got to realize I'm talking about things that they were 500 years ago. They, in the last 100 years or 50 years, a lot of these churches have embraced a lot of things they didn't at one time uh, do. And they divided among themselves. So I'm just trying to give you the basic history and the way these things started. The claim is made that the scriptures are the final authority in the Lutheran movement. And that was the key to it and the reason that uh, the Catholics got all beside themselves. Uh, if you look among them, you'll have different times that they locate as to when they say the Lutheran church began. It seems uh, as good as we can do, say around 1530, is the actual beginning date of the Lutheran church as a, its own organization. Now, Luther accepted two 
of the Catholic so-called sacraments. And that would have been baptism and the communion. Now, he had a different understanding of both of them. He believed that baptism was an immersion in water for the remission of sins. Though today the Lutheran church practices sprinkling, it will permit pouring or uh, immersion if it's requested. Uh, but they do that for infants or for adults who may be converted to Lutheranism following a catechistic study of proper instruction. The Luther, Lutheran church teaches that one only has to believe in Christ, uh, that is, accept Him as Lord and Savior of their life, nor to be saved by Him. But they must submit to some form of baptism to gain membership in the church. That tells you something about how loose the whole thing is when it comes down to adhering strictly to this Bible they say is the only rule of faith and practice. So you can advocate that. You can be true. You can be right in saying the Bible is the only thing that governs us. Well, that's a good statement. But then when it comes down to the practicality of it, then they actually don't. Um, sprinkling is practice, again, notice, out of convenience. Luther also taught, and probably a lot of people don't understand this, the doctrine of consubstantiation. Uh, that, of course, relates to the communion, the Lord's Supper. And what does that mean, consubstantiation? I would ask Buddy, who's a convert out of Lutheranism, to tell us, but he may have forgotten. <laughs> consubstantiation. Uh, it's the idea that Christ is in, with, and under the bread and the fruit of the vine. Now that's opposed to the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. And they teach that when the priest blesses the bread and fruit of the vine, it actually becomes a literal body and blood of Christ. So there's a big difference there in, as far as what they teach. Although Luther's not right on what he taught about it, it's closer than what the Catholics teach. Worship in the Lutheran church is centered around the altar and the pulpit. And they have mechanical instruments of music in worship, as most do today and have for a long time. It goes along with the singing. And uh, their communion varies within the congregations and uh, the synods and as to frequency. Some take it once a week, some only a few times a year. And that all varies with individual members and congregations of which they are members. The Lutheran Church came to America with the immigration of many Europeans, especially those of what now is modern-day Germany, in the early part of the 17th century. That's the 1600s. In America, there are several different groups of Lutherans. And the basic differences have been in their national origin and language. But again, liberalism, modernism, and even fundamentalism has uh, divided them among themselves. There have been movements to bring them together, but that hasn't worked uh, the three largest groups of the denomination are one, the Lutheran Church in America, and that's the more liberal or loose group. Their headquarters in New York. And number two, and I don't think some of these things have changed recently, the Lutheran Church of the Missouri Synod, and that's a more conservative group, and the headquarters are in St. Louis. And then what's called the American Lutheran Church, and it's middle of the road. And uh, it has some of both, conservatives and liberals. It was formed in 1961 from three smaller Lutheran groups. It's headquarters in Minnesota. And you may find there are many smaller groups and various things. I'm not trying to bring us up to date today. I'm just trying to give you the basics of what has been. Local congregations of the Lutheran denomination are co controlled by church council. That council is made up of the pastors, they call them, and certain elected representatives from that given congregation. And each congregation is free to select its own pastor, preacher. And these congregations are all united in synods, which in turn are drawn together in the national and international conferences. They have national and state headquarters for their conferences, their mission work, everything else. 
And you can find all of that if you want to look it up on the Internet, for that matter. But this is from, denomina from denominations uh, around us by Brother Don Tarby in 1971. Now, with that in mind, and I hope that's too much, too much history, <laughs> uh, I want us to focus in on some major doctrines of the Lutheran Church. Uh, well, first of all, the Lutheran Church itself is a doctrinal issue because you can't find any such thing in your Bible. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, study your Bible and you will. <laughs> if you'll accept what it says. Uh, Luther opposed the use of his name, as I've already noticed, uh, among his followers. Uh, but I also noticed they did it anyway. I think we ought to remember that here's where they see themselves as a denomination. They do not see themselves the whole of the body of Christ, but only a part of it. And this is where that they would fall under the condemnation of the Apostle Paul's inspired writing in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13, where we're commanded on those matters to be of the same mind, same judgment, that there be no divisions among you, and don't be called after people. Uh, if you read your New Testament, you know that we're to call the save, the institution of the save. If we call it anything, we refer to it as the New Testament says, and that shows you it's called after the one who saved it. And uh, thus, uh, you have Paul writing in Romans 16, 16, The churches of Christ salute you, showing the relationship of he who saved them with the saved and vice versa. There's always a danger of putting an unauthorized name to the church today. And looking up the word denomination, it's interesting to see how Webster does it in his New Collegiate Dictionary. Here's what we learn about names from him. He gives these definitions. Act of denominating. Naming. Under point two, a name, designation, or title, especially a general name, a category. Three, a class or society of individuals called by the same name, a sect. Four, one of the series of related units or values denoted by special names as the denominations of the United States money. One dollar bill, five dollar bill. Now the point is that all these definitions use the word name, which we have capitalized as we've emphasized I've tried to anyway, these very points. Now, we usually say it has no proper name, and that's what we mean by name. You have terms of designation for the church. You don't have a proper name. There's one proper name, and it's applied to individual members of the church, and that's Christian. And the meaning of it is of Christ. There is no proper name, as denominations use it, to apply to the Lord's church. Just terms of designation. So we're expected to teach and speak the same thing, 1 Corinthians 1.10. We're expected to walk by the same rule, Philippians 4.16. So the whole denominational concept that we've mentioned a lot lately is just foreign to the New Testament view. The church of our Lord, as you read of it in the New Testament, is the whole. When the church started in Acts 2, people obeyed the gospel, the power of God to save men, Romans 1.16. And when they had believed, repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ, and were baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, the Lord added them to others who had done likewise. He added them to the church. Well, I think he still does that. If you from the heart believe the gospel and obey it, where is he going to put you? In a bushel basket? No, he's going to add you to those who have obeyed the gospel too. So each congregation in a geographic location is the church of Christ and all together the churches of Christ. Now if we start calling uh, one congregation the uh, Day Star Texas Church and we talk about another one as the Day Spring Arkansas Church and another one as the Bright and Morning Star Church of Louisiana uh, we're creating denominations. We're denominating. We're saying they're all parts of the whole, but they're not the whole. But the Lord's church is the whole. And he built one church, Matthew 16, 18. And when people obey the gospel, he adds them to that church. Now, organizational-wise, then the congregations are organized on a, in geographic locations, such as the church at Spring, or the church in Jerusalem, the church at Corinth. But that's just the organizational structure. It's not organized worldwide. It's organized locally. So to have the one whole church organized like it ought to be, then to be organized locally. But all of them are under the same head and 
obey the same gospel and live according to the same rule as Paul said in Philippians that we ought to walk by the same rule. There's also the confusion among them, the Lutherans, about salvation in, in Lutheran church. If you look at what Martin Luther believed, he thought one should be immersed, and he thought, as I said earlier, they ought to do it for unto the remission of sins. And yet, here's where his confusion comes out. He emphasized faith only. And as I've said, that's because of the meritorious works of the Roman Catholic Church. And this emphasis has laid the groundwork for the false view of salvation by faith only held by most every denominational, Protestant denominational church today. His emphasis also resulted in the Lutheran church itself being believing that salvation is by faith only and it being followed by sprinkling and that's not to be saved but to get into the Lutheran church. That's fundamentally what's done. They're not the only ones along that line. But that's, that's where all these things a lot of times came from. Um, we won't belabor that point. Sprinkling is not a barrel in water. It is water put on somebody, uh, a little bit of it anyway. I've told this story before, but it shows how people can get so caught up in a man-made view they just can't see the forest for the trees. When I was just a little boy, my daddy coming out of the Methodist church, and he hadn't obeyed the gospel yet, so he took us to a Methodist revival, but he had already been studying with my grandmother from the book of Acts about the plan of salvation. And there was a couple that came forward at the answer to the invitation at the Methodist church after their preaching was over that night, and they put water in his hand and put it on top of their heads. And I was trying to get away from mom and daddy when everything was over to get up with my grandmother, and I got to her, and they were down the path a little bit there, and she was trying her best to get to my daddy, and uh, she just saw she wasn't going to be able to do it, so she grabbed me and she said, you be sure and tell Roland he had more water in his hand than it looked like. But I don't think he could hold that much water in his hand to bury somebody in it. So you, you get in things like that, and you, it, it's carried on for so long, and people can't see outside the box. It's what everybody does, and that's all acceptable, and they're good folks, and blah, blah, blah. And so we end up disobeying God. There's nothing, there's not even a hint in the New Testament that baptism is anything other than immersion. Uh, that's the reason you have such descriptions as Jesus coming up out of the water, Matthew 3.16. Um, John baptized in places where there was much water, John 3.23. So on and so forth. Paul said when he and the Romans were baptized, they were buried and they were raised. Colossians says baptism is a burial, Colossians 2.12. Now the Jewish believers uh, to whom the writer of Hebrews addressed himself had their bodies washed and they were baptized, Hebrews 10.22. Now Peter does make use of the word sprinkling. Yeah, he does that. But he's referring to the blood of Christ being applied to us and not with reference to water baptism. Later, in fact, in the same epistle, 1 Peter 3.21, he says, Baptism doth also now save us. But it's not the washing of the filth of flesh. It's not taking a bath. He makes sure to emphasize that point. It's to obey the Lord, to be saved from your sins, to have the blood applied that cleanses us from sin. And it's the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Thus we obey a form of doctrine when we're baptized by being buried in water and raised up to walk in newness of life. Our sins being remitted because of our being believers and repentant of our sins and obeying the truth. So salvation is not by faith only, not at all. And we need to understand those particular matters. And when you answer, you can see how when you answer them from the Bible, you're answering most denominations. Because I, I just don't know of hardly any denominations that would teach that you're uh, not saved by faith only. They're all going to teach it. And uh, most of them are so caught up in the idea that God loves us so much, His grace is so great, He's really not going to be that touchy about us whether we exactly obey Him or not. I'd say that rules now among all of the denominations and certain brethren. that you don't have to be really that concerned about getting it right. 
because your intentions are okay, and um, that'll do with God. His grace is so magnanimous and so far-reaching. But that's not what the Bible says. We could spend a lot more time on that, but we've spent time on those things over a period of weeks and always dealing with it in the plan of salvation, what God commands a person to do in order to be saved from his sins. We've talked about the matter of consubstantiation and all that kind of thing. Now, am I covering everything that they believe? No, I didn't intend to when I started. Because you have probably heard enough now to the point to where your mind just can't hardly sit there any longer. You know, your mind can only retain what the seat of your breeches can stand. And if you don't have breeches, your dresses. So I'm concerned... <laughs> I'm concerned that we do take into consideration these fundamentals, but any one of the things we've discussed today would mean that they're not acceptable to God. People don't want to say that. Ever notice how many people want to say, well, you're wrong. Well, in other words, they're going to hell. Oh, no, I didn't say that. In other words, God thinks you're wrong, and he's going to save you anyway. When you're doing what you know and I know is contrary to his word, but he's going to be happy with you anyway. You can't find that, but I see it all the time. I've seen it all my life preaching where people will say, well, yeah, that's not right. The Bible doesn't teach that. Well, are, are they lost? Well, no. That just shows a lack of faith on folks like that, the very thing they're contending for. They don't believe themselves. So that uh, is a thing that we've got to keep in mind and make sure we're consistent ourselves because you can charge denominations with being human and practicing human doctrine to be right about it. Well, what about your own conduct in the church? Are we doing all things by the authority of Christ as we know the Bible reveals that authority? Or do we condemn these folks over here while we basically in our own area do the same thing? Well, it'll never get past God. It never will. And so we must know that if we're going to be faithful to the Lord as a Christian, as you read about it in your New Testament, you're going to have to change your life. And sometimes it's radical changes. It means really sacrificing things to cease doing them as you want to, and to do them only as the Lord authorizes. He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him, Hebrews 5, 9. It doesn't work any other way. Yeah, that's too hard, preacher. Well, I just gave you the Word of God. Does it read different in your Bible? Does it mean different in your Bible? No. He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Well, what if you don't obey Him? He's not the author of salvation for you. So I'm concerned about being right. When did we ever learn, brethren, that we shouldn't be concerned about being right? I'd like to know that. <clears throat> it's all right to be wrong. You can be wrong. Well, I found out people like that say, it's all right to be wrong in the things I want you to be wrong on, but on the things I want you to be right on, you've got to agree with me. <laughs> That's what happens. So it, it shows you something's wrong with people's honesty and integrity when they do that kind of thing. So when a person obeys the gospel, they have to have the full intent of following Christ as close as they can, and that means according to his will the rest of their life. Now the Bible talks about members of the church who fail from time to time, gives us a second law of pardon. And if you see you've committed a sin or sins, you can't see that unless you know you transgress God's will because sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. When you see that sin, you turn away from it in repentance, and you confess it and pray to God for forgiveness. And then you don't do it anymore. Well, yeah, but I made a mistake again. Fine. Turn away from it. But you don't practice sin. The Christian does not engage in the practice of sin. When I hear people say, oh, we're all just either saved sinners or sinners. No, that's wrong. That's not speaking as the oracles of God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we repented of living a lifelong practice of sin. And we obeyed the gospel. We were raised to walk in same old life. That old life was habitually practicing sin and not caring about God. Are we raised to walk in newness of life? Well, what is it, newness of life? You labor with all your power not to sin, and when you do, you correct it. And so John was saying in the first epistle, my little children, don't sin. Well, I guess he told us something we shouldn't do. But there's our goal. And when we've been converted to Christ, we're baptized into Christ, I am not a saved sinner. My sins were remitted at baptism, and the sin I commit as a Christian is cleansed by the ever-flowing blood of Christ that was applied to me in baptism. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all 
sin. Well, it does or it doesn't. Well, that's talking about people on the cleansed side of baptism. So we're not saved sinners the way the term sinners is used in the Bible. We're saved to sin no more. Go thy way, Jesus said, to a sinner and sin no more. Well, he just didn't know you can't do that. Well, you take it up the Lord on the judgment see how far you get. I know where it will lead you. The fact of the matter is the system is such that when you obey the gospel and you confess your sins one to another, the blood cleanses. And we're not that old man of sin who was out there separating us from those alien sins. I'm a saved New Testament Christian. The blood of Christ cleanses me, and before God I appear as though I've never sinned. When I die in that shape and stand before me in the resurrected body at the judgment, I'll stand there as if I'd never sinned. I mean I didn't sin? No. In very fact, I believe in Christ and obeyed Him, knew I sinned. And I was picked in the heart by the gospel and knew that. I wanted forgiveness. Well, I stand before him either forgiven, covered by the blood of Christ, or I'll stand before him unforgiven. There's no other way. So you can be a new creature in Christ today if you've never become a Christian, as we've studied. As a child of God, <clears throat> you either stand before him now having committed sins you have repented of, or you have an attitude that says, you have repented, and you work toward that repentance, and you're ever confessing your sin, praying God for forgiveness. It's ever reality in your mind that you need the blood of Christ. And if First John 1, 7 doesn't teach us, it continues to flow to cleanse us. Once we rise from water to the grave of baptism, will you tell me what it means? It does mean that. So if you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come where we stand and sing.